everyone, and thank you for joining us for what I uh, believe genuinely is the most important panel of the forum. I, I say that even though our CEO is in the front row and he had another panel today, but this is the <laughs> panel. This is the panel. Uh, as each of our three countries prepare to enter a period of prolonged pre-election, whether it's paralysis or polarization, uh, the key question is, what is the proper role for the private sector in helping to advance and achieve North America economic integration? I would be remiss if I did not say that our panel is being held in the perfect room as uh, the Tom DeQuino room. As, as all of us heard this morning, Mr. DeQuino has devoted his life and career to ensuring that the private sector plays a leading role in shaping the North American economy and uh, both as, as a, a co-chair of the North American Forum and founding CEO of the Business Council of Canada. So this is, uh, this is the, the right room for us to be in. And we could not have a better panel for this discussion. Uh, I will start with my immediate left. Uh, Sandra Prupatello is a member of the board of directors of Martin Ray. Uh, she's a co-founder of Reshoring Canada. Uh, she's president of the Canadian International Avenues and uh, was and served for many years as Minister of Economic Development and Trade for Canada's largest province, the province of Ontario. Beside her is Scott Center. Uh, Scott is President of National Office Systems. He's Board President of World Trade Center Savannah, and he's a member of the Global Board of Directors of World Trade, Asso World Trade Centers Association. And last but certainly not least is Jorge Esteve, who is Executive President of Ecom Agro Industrial and Vice President of the Consejo Mexicano de Negocios. So thank you, and, and please join me in applauding our panel. Thank you. Uh, I thought it would be best if we started by giving each of the panelists just a few minutes to share with us their vision of how the private sector can advance and further strengthen North American economic integration in the coming decade. So Sandra, why don't you start with Sure. First, thanks so much. It's a delight to be here, to be here in Mexico City. It's not my first trip. Uh, last time I was here, I was signing an agreement, actually, between the state of Mexico and the government of Ontario. So uh, it'd be interesting to see just how far we've progressed since those signings of agreements. Um, I, I am delighted, though, to have this opportunity to talk about it, because everyone's talking about reshoring, and certainly in the, in the context of North American integration, I think we do have to talk about reshoring from a broader perspective, and that's not just uh, who is benefiting the most right now, which is absolutely Mexico, but how all three countries can benefit from a reshoring, ally shoring, friend shoring, whatever you want to call it. And business people need to keep in mind that there is a political overlay that the people in Canada or the people in the US, they're delighted that we're having some function of reshoring. They'd be really delighted if it was happening in their country. So how do we make sure that everyone is benefiting from that phenomena? <coughs> And what do business people have to do to encourage that as well? There were three things I wanted to mention. One was more Mexican investment in Canada and in the US, not just everybody coming into Mexico. That isn't, that isn't gonna serve us well in the long run uh, because politically it will make a difference on how policies get instituted, how quickly, and who does it seem to be helping. It has to be helping all of us. So whether we like it or not, the business community needs to worry about what the politicians are thinking. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was about labor mobility. I think the chair, Martin Ray, was very um, focused on that when he was discussing it at his panel yesterday. Uh, it's an issue for lots of companies who have to have a better way to function to move their key personnel across countries, make it easier for them. They do better business when they can bring the right personnel uh, into their shop at the right time. Uh, labor mobility, as a title, though, has grown. I'm, I'm understanding it's not a good word to use. We have to talk about it in a competitive language. How can we help uh, do that? And I want to talk, hopefully, through this panel, how can we have better competition by better utilizing our, our people across three countries? And, um, and finally, I wanted to talk about that reshoring concept and how it has to be seen in a positive way in America and in in Canada. We know what's happening in Mexico, but we need to know why is that benefiting us in Canada? Why does Martin Rea benefit in our headquarters in Vaughan because Mexican plants are doing so fabulously well or that other OEs are bringing their companies into Mexico, giving our Mexican plants more business? So we have to answer that question so that our employees in Martin Rea, Canada, the Canadian government understands that this is a really great phenomena for us, so they'll be doing cartwheels just like we are. 
That's excellent. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Scott? Uh, thank you. And I also want to thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a real honor and a privilege to be here. The last time I was here was for uh, the World Trade Center uh, Board of Directors meeting that was here at the World Trade Center in Mexico City. So thank you for having me. Um, the, the question of uh, how can um, private enterprise help with the integration. Actually, you can't have the integration without private enterprise. Um, it's, our role is a lot more important than the government role. The, um, we have to be, well, everybody wants to be proactive. But in this situation, you can't be proactive. We have to be reactive because we don't know what the government's, what laws they're going to pass, what policies, and we have to, by working together, uh, deal with that and succeed no matter what kind of curveball they throw us. I mean, who would have thought that trade would be um, held up by something called the Mexico City policy? And we don't, I don't even know if it's still in effect. I don't know if it's coming or going. It, it changes every day. But when we get together, partnerships, uh, that, I'm, that's why I'm involved with the World Trade Center Association. You, we've got World Trade Centers all over the globe. And whatever government and whatever country comes up with uh, some policies that may help or hinder us, we have professionals on the ground who can deal with that. And we got some smart people in the world, and, and, and we can solve problems. And as uh, uh, Mayor Adams was saying this morning, he looks at those problems as opportunities. And a good example is, it is like you were talking about Mexico with deer-shoring. All the supply chain problems that we've had, it's, uh, Instead of being a horrible thing for Mexico, it's, it's been a boon, and we need to see how it could be for all of us. Scott Jorge? Yes, hi, Jack. Uh, Sandra, Scott, it's great to be with you guys. Uh, I think you made very interesting points. I would like to just put a little bit of context, no? But I remember, you know, the first time we went around in the free trade agreement, it was Mexico begging, no? And there was, we want, we don't want aid, we want free trade. And, and I think we've come a long way from there. And, and to that, let me exemplify. Uh, we were in Cancun and we had meetings with our three government, Secretary Eng, or Minister Eng. We had uh, also the USTR and we had also the Secretary of Economy, Secretaria Buenrostro, no? And what was interesting that for the first time, at least in my experience, before the meeting, the private sectors of Canada, the US and Mexico got together and said, hey, let's give them a unified message. And I think it was very nice to go there and work out together. And, and you know, in a couple of hours, we had an agreement no, and Louise, who's in the front, helped us. She guided us. She acted as a moderator. She was very important. But it was very nice to see this work working together. And we all realized, and I think for the first time, it wasn't the Mexicans trying to sell why it was important. I think the private sector gets why together we are more competitive. No, we have a wonderful region and we have a responsibility. And I'm also going to quote uh, 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 something that that, that, that was said in the panel I was previously, but uh, the North America is 6% of the population and 26% of the GDP, you know? So that's the type of opportunities we have, and we can get into a lot more detail, but we're a very fortunate uh, region and we have an, an obligation, you know? And we have this free trade agreement that, that is very important. Uh, we have a renegotiation, we have a 16 year agreement, but it's going to be negotiated in 2026. That doesn't give a certainty to a lot of long-term investors, especially when you have certain compliance issues. Now you have compliance issue of, of the Canadians in the dairy sector, you have the Americans in the uh, auto parts origin, and you have Mexico possibly uh, some controversies on energy and, and corn. So basically those are little things that can really derail this effort that gives long-term certainty uh, to, to basically uh, to investors in, to, and to, to, to do it. I, I hear loud, loud, loud and clear, both from Scott and, and from Sandra, that Mexico needs to do a better job 
creating value elsewhere. No, and it's true. No, I think there is a lot to learn, and there is a lot of opportunities. We need to look more north. Uh, you know, one thing that I would say that that's important. Mexico is starting to make a difference, not so much for Canada. I realize there's a lot more to do. If you look at the amount of trading, it's probably uh, less than 8% as the trade that goes on with the United States. But we really have to change that. And, and it is a big challenge that we have to get. But just for the US to Mexico, uh, the, while exports from Mexico to the US grew 14%, exports from the US it grew 17%. So we're starting to add value, but I agree there's a lot more we can do and we look more naturally, historically, we have looked at the US and we need to start looking more to Canada. And I can probably, as the meeting goes on, Jack, I can talk a little bit about what we're trying to do. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Sandra, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think one of the things the private sector can do uh, is, is not only identify potential challenges, but also solutions. And, uh, pointed out, Mr. Wildeboer said it last night, particularly in this area of labor mobility within companies, can you explain some of the ideas you've been thinking about? Well, you know, as a former Minister of Education, I will tell you that nobody wants to be told what to do when you're the government. <laughs> However, uh, when businesses put their minds together and they go to government and say, this is what we need for our industries, governments do listen to that. Colleges, they, they, they're desperate to try to respond to their local uh, initiatives and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, so they don't want to compete. They, the universities and colleges, they, they want to be better than their neighbors, right? But there's a commonality amongst the sector that would say, why don't we do the gap analysis? So what's the difference between the college in Nuevo Leon and the one in St. Clair College in Windsor? What's the difference in that curriculum that means I can't get that guy from Mexico to come and do that that work that I need done in Canada. Well, those two curricula, they're not gonna change it on their own. It's nobody's job to do that. But it would be interesting that you'd say, the industry has said that this is the gold standard for what the curriculum needs to look like. All of a sudden, they're all gonna be chasing to be producing and offering that gold standard. So business gets in the middle of it, is the one to say this is what we want, and then leave it to governments to be the ones to be aggressive enough. And there are organized governments who will be aggressive enough to say, no, no, we're gonna be the first ones to offer this gold standard. And in some jurisdictions, they have private schools. In ours, it's, it's all public, but they'll do it. And I just think that's one of the ways we can say, you don't need to worry that we're, regardless of where they're coming from in North America, we know that that tool die guy knows what he's doing. And that woman who's doing the welding is, and actually women apparently are, are better welders, I understand. Um, th that's they're, very they're, sexist. That it is, it's factual, but anyway, um, you know, I, so I'm just saying that they're all going to have that same skill set that we need, and that is one way to have that free flow. Um, I do think that we have to be talking about how we get them across the border, and in my view, business has to step forward and say, I will take responsibility for this person that's crossing the border to do this job, and if that person doesn't come back, that's on me. And when governments hear that businesses will take the responsibility, they aren't gonna wear it politically. So business has to turn around and say, if I was sitting in that chair and I'm the Minister of Immigration, oh my God, we just had a snafu. And it's happened. Um, there were people during the pandemic that were being let in into Canada and they weren't the right people and that word got out. Um, and then that's a disaster for everybody. So government can say, well, business, it's your responsibility and here's your fine if something goes awry, so businesses will take it really seriously. Let them own that process. I think that may be a solution. Uh, I think it's a good one. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Scott, for those of us who may not be as familiar with the World Trade Center and the World Trade Center Association okay. and the great work it does in helping uh, business leaders, could you maybe tell us about that and particularly what, what you're doing here in Mexico? Well, um, Mexico has a very strong World Trade Center uh, movement here. We've got 12 very strong World Trade Center associations. And how it works is kind of like I described earlier. Um, there'll be an opportunity or a problem or an issue, and the World Trade Centers offer trade services. And so they will help map out how to solve a problem. We should get on the, the migration problem you're just talking about, but um, that would be a good way to focus our energies. But um, so when you buy a World Trade Center license, all of a sudden you're in a network, a global network, where you're taken seriously. You could, uh, I, me personally, I have a small business in Savannah, Georgia, but I can talk to somebody in Beijing, China, 
because of my work with the World Trade Center Association, and, and it's, a, it's a real benefit for small and medium-sized and even large businesses to get involved with this network. And, and back to what you were talking about, we, we have a, um, right now, at least in my region in the United States, I think all of the United States, we've got a booming economy, but uh, one problem that it scares me is this labor shortage. Yet we have people who are dying to get it, literally dying to get into the country. And uh, you're right, we have to figure out a way. Um, and the people are trying to get in, they want to come to work. They don't want to come for, to take advantage of our social services. That's, that's not true. They want to work and have uh, a better uh, uh, future for their families. And so there's got to be a way that we can figure out that, and, and it, it's not, I mean, businesses have to play a role in, as you said, and go to the government, but they're just, there's such an overwhelming need, and you read story after story of people who are in the United States and cannot, I mean, they, they have jobs for them, but they're not allowed to hire the migrants. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Jorge, uh, the Consejo Mexicano de Negocios, I think, is recognized globally as, as, as one of the more ambitious and active uh, business organizations doing work with international counterparts uh, around the world, but certainly in North America. Did you, could you tell us a little bit about the work you're doing and some of the initiatives you're leading now? Sure. Uh, of course, Jack. I, I want to just briefly touch on migration. I, I think we need to hold our politicians accountable. Uh, and, and I think to that, I think uh, Canada does, does a lot better job than the United States. Mexicans, when they migrated, when you had this big migration, uh, they weren't Mexicans that wanted to, to stay. They had temporary visas and, and they came and they went back. All of a sudden there was talk that those temporary visas would go away, so they stopped coming back. But I think immigrants like that. So a solution where we have labor mobility, where it's temporary, we can learn their skills, where they can add value makes a lot of sense. And we have to hold our, our, our politicians accountable because sometimes they do those mistakes uh, by, by, by not taking action, not taking decision, then all of a sudden you have this uh, immigration uh, problems, no? But, but going back to subject, Jack, and you say, what are we doing? I, I think, uh, like I said, we're working hard. One of the very good and interesting groups that we have is be between the Consejo Mexicano and the Business Council Canada. And we're, we decided together in a meeting in Mexico City about a year ago that we we're going to work on three axes. And the idea was basically moving forward and anticipating that we're going to have to look at the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, in 2026. So we put th three panels. And, and the first panel that we have is, you know, the USMCA, the trade agreement, you know, it, as a successful agreement for competitiveness. So what, what have been the benefits for the integration of North America and US competitive? And, and the reason we say, hey, uh, why, why US competitive? Because I, I think we have to be realistic. The guys that can derail the North American free trade agreement are the Americans and it's probably will have to do with something in politics. So we want to concentrate on having a public document where we can uh, outline without any bias, hard data, what are the things that are, are helping us? How is this making ourselves more competitive? How is this saving jobs or creating more jobs in the United States and having US and Canadian and Mexican products more competitive across the world. So that's something is very important. Another thing that we want to do in this group is a map of Mexican American Canadian invest, investments, trade, jobs, and value creation. You know, get that map. How's it going? How is it doing? What can we do to attract those investments, for example, from China? That they have, you know, you think that Mexico is one of the biggest uh, that have gained the most. It's not true. Uh, uh, the, the Asians are eating our lunch in a way. So, so that, that's panel number one. And I think, the, the, and also what's fun about this is that we have very good leaders from the Canadian side, uh, Victor Doggy, who's the, uh, with the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. We have Adrian Sada from Vitro. So very good, hard-hitting, analytical guys, no? The second pillar that we have is 
uh, how are the key USMCA provisions working, the mechanisms and institutions, you know, what's working and what's not, because that's also important. And like I mentioned before, compliance is an issue, and I think we need to get serious about it because it will be the little details that derail us. And here uh, we have another good group. We have uh, Rob Rob Wildebeer from Martin Rea, who everybody knows, and obviously they launched a new tequila that I hope to taste soon. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and also an excellent businessman, uh, Armando Sada, who's also very analytical, and I'm sure that you know, working together, uh, these good teams will put together a good work that will be the base for the defense uh, of the free trade agreement. And then we have a third one. Uh, that I think Sandra will be very happy because we want to look to strengthen Mexico and Canadian relations beyond the USMCA. So that's also important. So we want to work logistics, supply chain, mobility, as you talked about, work, workforce development. I think the, the work that Canada has done with the indigenous community is also an example that we could learn from. So, so this is the type of things we need to work together. And here we have from Canada, Art de Fer, who's, who has furniture business across the through North America. And we have Antonio del Valle. This is a creative, this is the out, thinking outside the box. But you know, hey, I'm not in any way suggesting we open Pandora's box of renegotiating the, the North American Free Trade Agreement. But these are the things that we can start working together to increase commerce between the, U, the, the, the Mexico and Canada and, and make that big difference. Because yes, I get it. The, 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 the free trade agreement will be attacked if, if the value generation is not being done equally. That's on extent. Mm -hmm. you want to jump in? I, no, just that, you know, when we talk about migration, we have to not put both immigration and refugee discussions in the same box. It's not. Immigration systems are very different from refugee systems, certainly in Canada, mm -hmm. certainly in the U.S., I'm certain in, in Mexico as well. And the immigration system is bogged down. We don't have enough people to move people through a very good system quickly, and that's a problem. So if you're gonna promote something, it's get more people working on a very good system, which is, is well known that the Canadian system is a good one. The refugee issue is a very different issue. And for us, or the business community, to come forward and say, oh, you, just, you can't hold them up, you, you've gotta let the people, in, without acknowledging that it is not 100% fantastic to have all people come in as refugees. It isn't. There are people who are trying to get into our country that we don't want. And we need to be honest about that to say, you've got to figure out how you're going to filter a system much quicker to get people in who we obviously all want to be here, but there will be that 1%. And no one here so far in two days has spoken about the 1% we don't want. And it makes us seem naive to the reality that government has to face in every country. So they don't want the murderers and the whatever. And you know how horribly used those phrases have been politically. So we don't want to get into that. But you can't avoid talking about how you can help create a system that can help streamline and move it quickly, quickly so you can get the people in. Because you know the majority, 99% of the people are the ones we want and are going to benefit our society. So you have to at least acknowledge that you got to find a figure, you got to figure out how to filter as well. And no one talks about that because we all want to be, you know, want to be nice and we need to be realistic. So I think in our language here, we need to acknowledge that it can't be 100%, you can't just blow the doors wide open, that is not politically acceptable, and the blowback from that will be worse. Um, so I just think we, we gotta be realistic about what governments face when it comes to refugee issues and deal with it. Um, you know, Canada has done a, a lot of work in this, in this, but we've got 40 million people, and this year we're tracking to 1.2 million people, new people coming into Canada. So we're, like, we're doing our part here. Um, but obviously we've got a lot more work to do. But to your yes. point, Scott, and as, as Sandra said earlier, I mean, credentials recognition, you know, you could have people who have the skills uh, that, that each of our countries need, mm -hmm. but due to, again, either local licensing or certification rules, right. they just won't be able to practice in their profession and, right. and their skills go to waste. Right. So and I think that's, that's something. They won't show up at the, at the border and say, I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. And they'll look at you and say, well, actually you're not because you don't have our certification. Mm -hmm. And I dealt with that in our governments. And, and we knew that it's not the Royal College's job to get those people accredited in our system. Whose job is it? And that's why I said in the first instant, if the business community can do that gap analysis to say, 
here's what you would need to get those people in so that they're all accredited in the same way, then when they're coming in, they're gonna have what actually we acknowledge. And that's a big step forward. Can I talk a little bit about those that aren't accredited? Mm -hmm. At least in Georgia, we have the, the best system in the world for training people for the, the jobs that are needed. It's, mm -hmm. We have like 100% placement, literally nearly 100% placement rate from our technical colleges to uh, people getting uh, jobs in the field they're trained in. So there's got to be a way to get these people who are dying to get in to get to us and let us train them. And it'll be, it's a win-win-win for everybody, for the, the people who are trying to get a better life, for our economy, for, um, for everything overall. But that 1% that we don't want, like you talked about right now in the United States, the rhetoric is all about that 1%. And Canada is probably, that's probably what you're talking about. In Canada, maybe y'all are ignoring it, but in, in, in the United States, all you hear about is that 1%. But, but like I said, that's why you have to acknowledge it oh, yeah. because you know that's what's stopping up the system at the moment is that it's as if we're not even acknowledging that there could be a problem. True. So what's the solution then? And I, and I think to your point, I think uh, this, and we've heard it at a lot of panels today, and I think it's, a, it's an important point and, and it's certainly something that, uh, that business leaders, you know, the, focus on, which is that the narrative sometimes it gets away from the facts. And, and uh, Jorge, I, I wonder if you could talk about some of the work that, that the Consejo is doing, that you're doing on the facts themselves, making sure that, you know, the private sector, making sure that the narrative is informed and that, that our government officials know what the real facts are in terms of the value of trade and, and economic integration. So it's a challenge, no? Uh, and I think we need to differentiate from the politician doing their business and telling the people uh, what they want to hear, tell them the people where it hurts, and, and the truth, no? Uh, the truth. Uh, and so for this, uh, I would just say, when we go with business, when we go with government, uh, I can only say there is agreement, Jack. There's nothing, that, you know, we don't have any discussions because I think everybody gets it, but sometimes the, the, the discussions be, uh, become politics and, 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 and the electors want to hear what they want to hear and, and not what the truth is. No, they want to blame that they're losing a job to basically the Mexicans and, and that the Mexicans are are rapists and criminals. It's not true. 99% of the people are people that, that I think uh, when, when I talk to, to people from, oh, you're giving, a, you're giving us all those bad hombres. You're getting the best of us. You're, you're getting people that are risking their lives for a better life. And we're keeping the ones that are lazy. So you should be very happy and very honored and get those people to work. So I, I think, Jack, at, at the end, I, I don't really see a big effort uh, in convincing, it's just a matter of the way to talk to the associations as much as possible so they don't use, when you have elections, a user country and, and user problems as a piñata to, to gain f political favor. And, and, and the narrative has changed a little bit from what you said. It used to be, hey, they're taking our jobs and they're rapists. Now nobody's losing jobs in the United States anymore. Everybody's got a job. So now it's just that they're rapists and murderers. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Switching gears, if I could. Uh, Sandra, in, in 2021, you co-founded uh, Reshoring Canada, uh, obviously post-pandemic. Uh, we, we've heard a lot uh, this uh, past couple of days and this week about nearshoring and reshoring. Could you tell us a little bit about Reshoring Canada and, and kind of what your focus was there? Sure, it really was to be advocating for public policy that would help companies uh, bring work back to Canada, but it was also to bring work back to what's best for their business which really means not overseas. Uh, it, it really means come back to North America because in that instant, it, that could be the best thing for your business. And I do think that there's work for us to do to, for, for Canadians to understand why is, a, why is moving something back to Mexico good for our company in Canada? They need to understand that. Um, you know, I think if they all were shareholders, like is the case of Martin Ray, a lot of our employees own shares of the company. And when they see the company does well, they're doing well. So this is a good business move. Um, then they're going to see how they can benefit. Um, we have to do that. I also think if you talk about climate change, and we have lots of NGOs whose focus is reducing the carbon footprint, 
Um, you could have a huge raft of NGOs all of a sudden wanting to promote North, and North American integration because it's better for the climate. It's better for the carbon footprint. Um, there's, there's less stuff coming from overseas. Uh, we're, we're helping our own markets here. And, and those are people that ordinarily wouldn't be talking about an economic benefit of, nor of um, North American integration. And yet, if they you know, think that through, that's what they'll want to do. And that really leads me to that other point of uh, with reshoring, we've got to make sure that each country gets a benefit of that. And if Grupo Mexico, a $27 billion company with all of their divisions, how can they not find a way to be investing in Canada? We're like the mineral capital of the world practically. How could they not be there? Um, Bimbo, does anyone in Etobicoke even know that the largest Canadian bread baking company is Mexican? I don't think they know that and yet they're headquartered there. Um, so Mexican companies have to do a better job when they are there to make sure people know that they're there and that you know that is because Canada is a great place to do business. I would say that you know, listening to the panels that we heard from, water issues, energy issues, uh, how to embed more technology, those are Canadian strengths. Um, the AI capital of the world is in Toronto and Montreal. Those companies should be here in Mexico helping you. So if your companies aren't going to come and invest right away in Canada, come and visit our clean tech companies because they're going to help you with a smart grid system. They'll help you with water technology. Uh, they'll help on all kinds of fronts that, you know, we've lived that life. When I was uh, the chair at Hydro for, uh, Ontario Hydro, we spent a lot of our time on smart systems for utilities. Well, I heard from the governor today about what they need to do to continue to get their investment in Nuevo León. So there's obvious activity here. And Jose, who represents the Ontario government, is sitting there waiting now to see what companies uh, from Ontario and Canada can he bring here to meet these companies and public sector. Uh, you know, the other interesting thing that I, I just don't know what the, the level is at now, but money's always going to be an issue. How do you build infrastructure you need? We have massive pension funds in Canada that can't find big enough infrastructure projects in our own country to mm. invest in. So they are going global looking for those projects. And that's not taking over an energy company, that's helping to fund it. You know, that's not taking mm. over a water system, that's helping to build it. So I actually think there's a huge amount of integration that isn't happening, should happen, and, and Cana you know, Canadian companies are the perfect partners. Um, so, Jose, you need to be very busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And Sandra, and I agree, and I was trying to write down all these opportunities oh, down, but I'm going to take the video and I'm going to send it to Art and Antonio because, yes, well, you make a lot of good so points. Fast. I have yeah. a book. Yes, actually, no. no, when I see the five minutes, I think they're only talking to Jack. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm not even looking. He's the moderator. So. <laughs> uh, uh, Scott, one of, one of the, uh, just, just very quickly, one of the things I think you pointed out was, was how World Trade Center and Trade Center Association helps when there's change in public policy. Obviously, we've seen uh, that public policy risk is increasingly of concern to, to business leaders around the world and certainly here in North America. Can you just tell us a little bit more again about how World Trade Centers help manage and mitigate that, that public policy risk? Well, because they have uh, boots on the ground everywhere. And uh, you, if you're in the World Trade Center, you know somebody who knows somebody. And that, that's how you get things done. So uh, it doesn't matter what part of the country, what uh, place on the globe that this policy has been written, uh, we have people who uh, can research it, understand it, and knows the people who are writing it. So we can have our influence that way. Um, and it's also about working together. Uh, we just had a, a great success. Um, I don't know if it'd be considered nearshoring or reshoring, but um, getting a Korean manufacturer to uh, start a plant in Savannah. And Savannah is a small provincial town. But we, we, the World Trade Center, uh, work with other uh, economic development authorities in, in, in the state of Georgia. We've got 20 uh, economic development authorities together, and we normally don't ever work together, and got together and worked on getting Hyundai, and they are bringing 15,000 employees to our area over the next three years. Untold billions of dollars in, in, um, in investment and, and the ripple effect. So we're going to have that in our area. It's going to change our area. It's, uh, and that's what I'm talking about. We need workers. Um, if we could somehow get the migrants through our training policies and be even allowed to sign up for training, it would, it would be just a boon for everybody. 
So it's uh, it's been a fantastic success, but uh, you know, we got to make it happen. We've got to figure out a way to get that labor. Some some sector specific examples, and I know your work in the in the agriculture and agri-food space. I see some colleagues in the aquaculture space. Driscoll Berries is here. Could you talk about uh, what the private sector can do in terms of economic integration uh, in in agriculture, especially where we see food security being such a concern? Let, let me try to probably put a little bit of context. No, if you look at the major geographic regions of the world, uh, I, I think we're in a privileged position compared to the rest of the, the areas in the world. I, I, if I would have to use one word to describe it, it would probably be complementary. We complement each other. Now, I, I think if you look at the US and Canada, they bring a lot of grains, they bring canola oils, they bring dairy products, eggs, poultry. No? So that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that makes us competitive in growing our protein, our beef, our pork, our chickens. No? So, so that's really interesting. And, and that's a comp competitiveness that nobody has across the world. And, and on the other side, we get uh, the opportunity to send you fruits, vegetables, uh, citrics at competitive prices. And, and if you have any doubts, you, you have all the fruits you want all year round. That wasn't typical. And that's happening. And if you go to Europe and you try to buy all this fresh product, it's a lot cheaper. So we are really doing a good job of working together, no? And further, if you look at the, you know, there's already a lot of mobility. I'm not going to say there's a lot more to do, but just if you go, if you're raising beef, sometimes they graze in Mexico, they're finished in the U.S., they're cut in the U.S., and the specialty cuts come back to Mexico. So, you know, that can't be, you know, the cattle move better than immigration, you know, that, so that's incredible. But, but that's the type of things that we see. Driscoll's is another example. They're doing all these berries. They have this huge uh, distribution, no? And, and you have Canadian and California companies moving to Mexico, doing Citrix, doing Almas, and doing all that, no? And, and the only thing that, that, that I hate that we have is the issue of GMOs, no? Because it's, it, there's a sensitivity of no GMO uh, uh, corn. It's stupid. Uh, the discussion of GMOs is over around the world. We're starting it in Mexico. And I, I don't think people even get the idea that your tortillas would be three, four, five times more expensive if you don't use GNO because the productivity is not there. But more than anything, you know, this is something that upsets our partners because there's no scientific evidence to back something as, hey, GMOs are bad for you. Even the Europeans that were objecting, it's, it's a non-issue now. So I think, I'm just saying, there's a lot of opportunities. There's already uh, the, the, the immigration line between country is practically non-existing. And I think uh, we need to further develop agri agriculture. We need to develop the southeast of Mexico, which is the poorest. It's, it's been unequally developed for a lot of years. So if I would have to say a concentration, let's work on the southeast of Mexico. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. And I apologize. That is all the time we have. I know that there's a lot more. Sandra has a book full of ideas. We want to talk to Sandra <laughs> afterwards. Uh, I know we have more people in the audience than when we started, which I think is a great sign. It's certainly better than the opposite. So I think we'll leave it there. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And how about a round of applause for our panel? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jeff.